are you thinking about having any children? Well, how's your career going? It must be tough to have to decide between whether you want to progress in your career or, or whether you want to have children. And I'm like, do you ask any guys that? If you wouldn't ask it to a guy as these little put down, undermining questions, then don't ask it. And we set up my own agency. And he's like, well, what are you going to call it then? Jerry Studio, obviously. When he's setting up, I'm like, now. <laughs> <laughs> So now it's time to share part two of the story of Jack, the DNAD president risen from the Glaswegian high-rise flats. I'm going to resign. I'm going to resign right this minute. This additional pressure is just coming in my direction. I'm just going to take it because that's just what I do. And I thought, or I could just not take it. So what did you do? You can earn a lot of money in the creative industries. You can travel the world. But I think our government doesn't do anything to raise the level of respect for it. They were like, right, it's time. You're going to need this transplant. Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way. And we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Uber, shaping the future for consumers as they go anywhere and get anything. Advertising on Uber connects brands with hundreds of millions of people using Uber around the world in the moments that move them most. To learn more about what we can do for your brand, visit uber.com forward slash advertising. Hi, I'm Jack Rennick, and this is how I became the president of DNAD and founder and creative director of Jack Rennick Studio. So now it's time to share part two of the story of Jack, the DNAD president risen from the Glaswegian high-rise flats a tenacious force that stays on course and never takes no for an answer. She's put in the work to show she's of true quality and not just a lucky chancer. We continue her story from part one of her journey into graphic design. And now we have more than 40 minutes, we can take more of a deep dive. So let's kick off where we left off and get back in it. Welcome to part two with DNAD president and founder of Jack Rennick Studios, Jack Rennick. Hello. There we go. <laughs> hey, amazing. Back again. Wow. So for people watching, they're going to see this back to back. So they've just seen us on stage uh -huh. at the DNAD right. festival. And now, do you know what we should have done? We should have done like that thing where you click. Oh, yeah. Stage. Like you. <laughs> yeah, you click. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if like... we do that, we didn't do it there. I know. <laughs> it's not going to make sense. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll just click anyway. Um, <laughs> yes. So here we are for part two of the story, which is impossible to tell in 40 minutes. So here we are, complete <laughs> it in all its glory. And the point we got up to last time mm -hmm. is you were just, we're about to, sh well, you just won your pencil oh, um, as a graduate. Uh -huh. And we were talking about your first job at an agency, mm -hmm. which is the only agency you've ever worked at before starting your own. That's right. Which is an amazing story in itself. <laughs> So you join as like a junior at 26 years old. Yep. And you you would rise up to become creative director of this yep. agency yep. in about eight years? Yes. Um, Phenomenal speed. Rapid. You know, yeah. Absolutely rapid. Yeah, unheard of speed. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so fast forward a bit. So yeah. It's eight years later. Yeah, eight years later. Become creative director. Yeah. What's the first job you're given as creative director? Tell us the story. Yeah. Uh, the first job I was given, I remember picking up this job, God, it was for a law firm in Austria. And uh, and I had always avoided doing law firm identities, somehow had ducked them at the partners. It's and not the, something you really set out to Yeah, do. it was not like, kind of, it, was, it was not record covers, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I had to sort of pick this up as this job. Um, and and I thought, right, okay, how are we going to do this? And I was utterly shitting myself, you know, I'm in this role. I thought, kind of a bit ahead of time. Somebody had left and they'd said, you know, right, we think you should go for it. And that they would support me in this role because I was quite sort of young to do it. 
and had this whole team of people, you know, just looking at you going, right, what do we do? And I'm like, oh, fuck, um, what do we do? And uh, I remember just like really struggling with it and coming up with like some really, really shit ideas. Like they were so shit and it was desperate and the meeting was like coming up and we're all flying over to Austria. And um, and I remember just going over and uh, firstly getting into the room and again having the whole Jack scenario and them losing their mind and phoning so what happened? Well, what happened? They, 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 I, I go in to the, the meeting and it's like, you know, this massive law firm, you know, pure marble everywhere and chandeliers and all this kind of stuff. And um, and then I turn up and they're like, ah, I did, you know, no, who's this wee lassie? You know, no, we are, like we are paying, yeah, we are paying for uh, top, <laughs> top agency fees, yeah. you know, like, who's this? And, um, Pointing at you. Yeah, yeah, like, basically, and they were just, like, not happy. And um and phoned the agency and uh and we're like you know no that's not you know not what we think we've bought. So you're you're at the agency and they then call you're yeah at I'm the I'm in I'm in Vienna yeah yeah in Vienna and Aye. they call your agency yeah like, we're not happy yeah that this girl has turned up yes um and so I walk into this room we like probably about fifty old men oh wow sitting around awesome. this massive uh you know conference room mm. you know it's like and I'm like oh. Here we go. Like a scene from, I don't know, Billions or... <laughs> yeah, you know, it was like, successful. you know, all these guys just sitting there, you know, all their suits and everything on, and I'm like, hi, hey, yeah. Blah, blah. just you? <laughs> Me and uh, a strategist okay. from the partners, who's a man, thankfully, you know, they like, they let him in. And um, and then I had, Martin did his bit, and then I did my bit, and he couldn't understand anything that I was saying, <laughs> anything at all. And I was trying to slow down, you know you try and lose a bit of my accent a bit you know trying to make them understood what make them understand you know and um and then after the presentation one of the main guy just went rah, 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 rah. you have just barked like a dog Ooh, <laughs> and i was like man. i was like what it's like we, we didn't understand anything and i was like oh fucking hell what do i do here and then actually i didn't like any of the ideas anyway so i just told them that I didn't like any of the ideas yeah. and I just said look I'm showing you stuff that I don't have any belief in Um, we didn't have enough time can we get more time uh, I'll come back next week I'll see you next week That's and mm. um, and we'll have better ideas and they were like okay mm. and at, at this point in time I, I'm about to get fired right? I, I'm, phoning, right. I'm phoning the agency going I've told them I need another week and now, I, now that I run an agency I know how expensive that is to just put an entire design team for another week on a project. I had no clue about it. I'm just yeah. going, This is. I don't feel right about this. I, I want to give the client a, a better outcome. And the client's not paying for that extra no, week. No, they're not paying that extra yeah. week. So when I get back, you know, I'm like, fuck, I'm in trouble. And I'm going to... This is your first this, yeah, job as yeah, yeah. director. Yeah, your yeah. First, so very got, first project. I nearly yeah. got fired from wow. the role, like mm. within like your first project. And um, but they didn't. They backed me up. We did another week. We went out. We had better stuff, and and I remember standing in the the meeting room with them. And they had been. They had said they wanted something brave and bold. And you know they were fifty years old. They had lost their spark. You know what could they do? And um, and I remember showing them some work. And they were like, "Oh no, it's like too brave." And then him to say to them, "Hang on a minute. You said our brief was this." And you said you wanted to be brave. And I was like, so if you don't do this, you're going to be boring, blah, blah, blah. Convince them to go with this route, wow. mm -hmm. you know. And it ended up, like, that end, That end went on and won quite a lot of awards for them. Really? Um, for, the, for our agency, for for their law firm, you know, really kind of re-established them. Wow. And by the end of it, you know, going into that, that original meeting and them not wanting to listen to what a woman had said, you know, four years later, they would, like, phone me up to ask, what tie they should wear to a meeting, if it was on brand enough and if they would look cool. Um, and what did I think of them wearing this or that? They would send me pictures or stuff and I'd be like, right, that one. The, you same, know? <laughs> the same company where someone did an impression of a yeah, dog yes. and said, you're barking at us. Yeah. And four years later, yeah. they're on yeah. the phones you all the time asking for advice. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. amazing. It was good. And it was great. And, you know, and I was like, you know, and that's like, I had felt going in, you know, I had to... Their, their fear of seeing a woman was not like, oh my God, here's a woman and I'm going to be doing girly design. I think the automatic impression is that I am not going to understand business. Mm. Like a man walking in with a suit means, oh yes, you will get our business. You will understand our clientele. You will understand what business means. 
Um, whereas a woman walking into the room this just still doesn't bring that kudos and that um, immediate understanding that you will get their business. So I've always felt I had to work 10 times harder at doing my homework on their business so that anything they ask me about, I can relate all concepts to their strategy and where they're going. For, for men listening to this, because mm-hmm. this is something you, you faced a lot in your career. Yeah, in life. Right. What is it like? So yeah, for men listening, what's it like to be a woman, to walk into a meeting with a client and um, and with a, a load of men in suits? What what yeah? What goes in your mind? Goes through your mind beforehand and, and in terms of your preparation. What are you thinking? Uh, what you know is as soon as you walk in, they are going to have doubt. You know immediately. Um, you know that that's just kind of societal. Uh, perception still that um, men know more about business than women and you're there not to show pretty pictures and design you're there to tell them about their business strategy mapping onto a brand strategy and and why this narrative of their brand is right why it's right for their audiences and therefore why this design is right to bring that narrative to life Um, so you know going in there that you have to be so immersed in their business, that is, if you as if you work there, and that you have you have taken all of their problems on board, you know. So anything they throw at you, you've got you, you know you've got nowhere to um, sort of hide behind any any design ideas. You need to know, uh, you need to know, uh, because your audience needs to see this because we've lived in your world, mm-hmm. and um, so I think it's it's always like that. you need to know it. You need to know the stuff way more than any man knows it. I see, yeah, because yeah. for a man. I don't think it's always, it's not always like that. You're not always thinking, not all men will be thinking, going into every meeting, I'm immediately going to be not valued. Or, yeah. You know, yeah. They're going to immediately think I don't know about business. If I turn up in a suit yeah. and I'm a bloke and I'm a white bloke maybe and mm-hmm. a white middle class or upper class bloke, there's a lot of those thoughts that aren't there. You're just like... Yeah, you just kind of, you know, and that, that, that's kind of like... um I've always said to guys, would you ask a guy that question? Mm. You know, and this has always been the thing, you know, when you're in a meeting or you're doing whatever and uh, folk will ask you questions that, you know, you just wouldn't ask guys. Like, I wish I could think of some examples off the top of my head, but, you know, um, just sort of like, you know, maybe some shit about you know, like any, are you thinking about having any children? You know, like, well, how's your career going? Um, it must be tough to have to decide between, you know, whether you want to progress in your career or, or whether you want to have children. And I'm like, do you ask any guys that? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Why don't you, why don't you, I know as if this is a thing. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. like, what fucking relevance is that to this presentation and in my mm. skills? Uh, being oh, able that's to, even in a presentation scenario. Oh, totally. Do you know what I mean yeah. like all prep, all pre questions and uh, kind of like, like you know, like um, yeah, you know, chat like a little beforehand. bit of chat or yeah. after the meeting, you know, you're having a, you get maybe go out for dinner or something like that. Do you know what I mean? And I'm just sort of like you know, think about it. Would you be asking these questions to a guy? And if you're not going to, if you wouldn't ask it to a guy as these little put down, undermining mm-hmm. questions, then don't don't ask it. Brilliant. You and know? what what um what what outcome do you find that 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 gets from the person? I think or not reaction. Uh, usually like you're like fuck, she's feisty. Oh my god, you know. And even like you know, it's like feisty. It's like I'm not feisty. What does feisty even mean? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, as a man, feisty. Do you mm. know what I mean? As a man that defends himself, feisty. Mm. Oh, feisty. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like ah, fuck off, feisty. Do you know what I mean? I'm like I know my stuff. Do you know what I mean? I've done the work. I know what I'm talking about. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't. Do you know what I mean, you know, mm-hmm. fucking feisty. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what would be your tips for for women that are working and having to present in more male dominated environments? Definitely, just always do your homework. Do you know what I mean? Just don't get caught out on uh, the business side of things because it will absolutely undermine your design. Your design, any of your design thinking, will immediately not be. Uh, viewed in the right light because it'll just be filled with yeah but is it relevant to to my business is it relevant to where we're going so it's like always framing anything that you're going to show in the business side of things 
and why it's relevant. You've got the audience, you understand the audience, you understand the audience needs, their world, and this is why. And th- this is what this this company wants to say to these people, and this is why this is relevant. You know, you've got to frame it in that full picture. You, you know, guys might skip through some of that stuff and be able to be like, all right, okay, we all know where we're going here. You know what I mean? We all know what, what needs to happen. But you need to evidence that so that you're putting yourself, uh, you're, you're, you're ticking those reassurance boxes before you even start getting on to, like, this is route one. Mm. Yeah. That's brilliant. Brilliant advice. And it's, the re- it's very helpful to share this because, again, I know what it's like to be a white male middle class bloke you just don't know until someone tells you this stuff. Mm. You just don't know that there's a whole load of stuff, you know, a woman has to do before going into a meeting or, or is sort of, you know, forced to do in a way because yeah. of how they're treated. Um, yeah. It's just, it's the more you understand what someone else's experience is like, the more you can go, oh, okay, wow, okay. Yeah. And that's how change happens with other people understanding what's going on. Yeah. Really. It's like that sort of uh, doubt and, there's probably very few occupations where a man walking into the room causes fear, where a woman walking into the room causes a bit more, oh shit, you know, and um, maybe like Doubt. a maybe like a midwife, you know, a midwife walking into a room, nobody's got, you know, who's a woman, is <laughs> nobody's got any worries about, but yeah. a male midwife walking into the room, you know, might get a bit of like, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Start questioning yeah, yeah, kind of like, hang on. So we're going to move on to a topic I think a lot of people will relate to. Um, I think you you describe you've got this you know desire for perfection. Yeah, and I think a lot of people have this this just desire to make everything absolutely perfect, the best it can be, you know, and just put everything into making it great. Mm-hmm. Especially if someone's in the world of of creativity, there's a lot of that, but could be in law as well again the contract's absolutely perfect or whatever yeah um but the downside or the the negative aspects that can come with it Mm. is this anxiety yeah depression yeah you know fear of failure totally things um yeah when did you first start to experience mental health issues uh probably became most most aware of it at art school um, just sort of like having the the fear to go into the class, mm. you know, without having something that was brilliant. I wow. felt like you know, kind of expectation was uh, to do something brilliant every time because that's what that's what I expect of myself. Yeah, you know, in retrospect, the lecturer just wants you to turn up and actually have done something, you know, to talk about. But you know, I'd be just absolutely cripple myself with if this isn't brilliant it's not worth showing and therefore I just won't even turn up so I started like not going to art school oh really yeah I just didn't go I went to, and um, and then I'd be getting into trouble with the art school and they'd be like you're not you're not attending class um, and I'd be like yeah I know and then they, they, they recommended I went to see a counsellor you know one of the one of the university counsellors And but I was in the I remember walking in the door um, literally hadn't even sat in the seat to tell this guy, you know, like how I was feeling, and he described me. I, you know, he was like, ah, right, you're you're stressed out. Here's Prozac. Gave me a prescription for Prozac. Mm. Came out. Thought, okay, took that. I was so out of my mind on this. You know, I I, I couldn't even go to art school because I, I didn't even know where the door of my house was. Yeah, wow. Do you know what I mean? I didn't even know whether I had. You know, and I'd be like, I, I the girl that lived across the hall from me. I'd be like. Could, I don't know if I've had a, ba- a shower or a bath or anything like that. And, and she'd be like, all right, the bath's wet. You've you've, you've had a shower, you, you know. Like, really? It's fucking it was really spaced out then. Totally away with it. It's just far too strong. And um, so... When 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 would you say, when was your... Because this is something you've experienced, you know, over time. Yeah, yeah. When, all my life. When, has it, when was it at its worst? Um, so definitely around about that point in time um, at art school. And um, I, I then... Came off of the Prozac because I, I was just so out of the game. And um, and then I just sort of st- sat in a flat. And I used to go down, I used to work in, I used to study in the Dundee Monday to Friday and then go down a Friday night. I worked in Glasgow at the weekends and then come back up again. And I remember having to phone, the pho- the shop phoning me that I worked in in Glasgow and going, like, where are you? You know, like your shift's starting. And, and I was like, 
I'm still in Dundee and I was I, I don't know where the train station is. I can't remember where the train station is. And they were like, what the fuck are you talking about? And I was like, I genuinely, I don't know where it is. This is when you're not on Prozac. Yeah. I'm off the yeah. But I was so strung out, do you know what I mean? That I just couldn't think straight at all. And then, so I was like, Phew. Um, so I had to give up. The, I just said I'm not coming back, and just hung the phone up. Wow. And then, and this is anxiety, depression. Or? It's like anxiety, and all sort of like fueled by just total fear of failure. Mm. You know, just fear of, I, like I'm just going to show stuff that's not good enough. So I would rather not show anything. I'd rather not. Um, if I, if I don't show anything, then I can't have failed. Yeah. Do right. you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas if I just run away from it, then then they can't say I failed because I didn't show anything. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was total, that was the fear. I was like, I couldn't show anything that I personally didn't think was any good. What was it like then in when you're, you're in the world of work, you're professional, you've been in it for a few years, you're having yeah. to go and present work to people. Yeah. Did it come up during those times? Oh, all, all of the time. All of the time. What was it, what was I mean, I spent then? probably about half my time and the, at the partners in the toilets crying really? you know i've tried to like psych myself up to go out and pin work on the wall you know like we, you'd, you'd everybody would share work on the wall and you'd go around kind of seeing the ideas and stuff like that and i'd be like oh my god try to put mine at like the the lowest part of the wall so you, you would know? go to the toilets uh -huh. and just cry yeah and try and you know get back together and things like that you know and how often was this happening uh phew. Daily, <laughs> really, really. Yeah. or mostly, you know, we'd have a few days or whatever like that to get some concepts together, and then I'd be like, right, okay, come on, come on, you know, and I'd always have to say to myself, you know, you're fucking from Glasgow, who gives a fuck about this stuff? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Fucking just put the door in, go in. Do you know what I mean like try and like almost like hype myself up yeah, and yeah, yeah. to like not caring? Do you know what I mean? It's like what they're going to do? Fucking kill you, you know, like. Um, Did anybody the, know you were going in the toilets, you know, multiple days? No, probably? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, you know, I just sort of... think to talk to anyone? No, no way, no way. That was like, I, I'd probably get fired. Do you know what I mean? They'd be like, oh my God, I've got a total nutcase on my hands. Do, do you know what I mean? That's what I felt. Like, I, there's no way I could let them know. My boss knew, you know, he knew that um, I, I had major anxiety sort of thing and he'd always be like, you know, just try and try and find an even keel we don't yeah. talk about it well, you know? what do you think organizations could do to to allow a, a safe space for people that are facing these challenges i think just let them letting folk know that they're not going to die you know and that they're not you're not going to fire them over um them having a bit of a panic attack mm. um that just to talk through the work and if the work if there's any spark in the work that they will find it and if there isn't then you will help them find why not yeah and how and how to then move forward that's all that's all you need is to to know that um i know it's shit and i know that you know this is going to be shit but can you help me work out why this is shit mm. and just maybe a wee a wee nudge in the in a different direction to help me not do the work for me but just to help me understand what it is that I'm missing, the pennies not dropping for me, like just to move on. That's what it was for me. I'm kind of like, I'm not getting this. I'm just, uh, there's something, there's something that I'm not getting um, to be able to make that leap. What would you, if you could speak to yourself now in that time, yeah. what would you say to yourself? Uh, I'd say, I'd, I'd probably say, you know, like 80% is better than no percent. Yeah. You know? Um, whereas I'd be like, if it's not 100%, I don't want anybody to see it, you know, and that's the, the perfectionism fear. And it's like, I, I will only show it if I feel it's 100%. And then, um, but I've had to try and learn that like genuinely 80% is better than nothing. And the 80%, somebody else can help you find the extra 10, 20%, you know, if you're in a team and they've got your back mm. and that that's what they're there to do. Rather than it's not always down to you, mm. you know. I take I take responsibility for everything. I adopt it. I think is, you know, if I if I haven't done the hundred percent of that thing, then I'm the failure. Mm. Without realizing that other people are there to help. And I guess like now in your career, or even ten years ago, you know, your eighty percent of now is mm -hmm. probably about a thousand percent of what you were like <laughs> twenty years ago. So. <laughs> 
that that bar will always move. What oh, you yeah. see is hundred percent is always going to go up. It always so. goes up. It's it's it's, it's really crippling. Yeah, it's re it's really really crippling. Still face. Yeah, I mean with that now. Yeah, I mean I was saying to you earlier that I had to present the DNAD awards the other night, and uh, and I had to write a load of speeches for it, and I find writing, you know, petrifying. I find it petrifying from like, who fucking cares about what my opinion on anything is? And h how do I f find the words to to say the sort of deep feelings that I, I want to impart in people? That's what's going through your mind. Yeah. Uh, about it. Yeah. And so I, rather than trying to put a bit of a draft down and starting to work through that, I just don't do it. I, I don't do it because I think I've got, I've got nothing to say anyway. And then and this is to how many people at the, the oh a few like a few thousand people few at thousand the thing. people you got yeah. standing there on your own yeah your speeches yeah and know that I'm representing DNAD uh, like I'm their president this year I need to look like I know what I'm talking about I need to say something meaningful to to these audiences and and especially as a woman running a small agency of her own I need to say something to try and connect and give hope to other women in the audience and other young women especially. And so, you know, I'm I'm ending up doing what I always do, which I don't recommend, is I'm there behind the curtain, writing the speeches directly into the auto queue, you know, <laughs> at like not long before yeah you have yeah to be up there. all the music scored and everybody's taking their seat and everything. Like, and I'm like <laughs> fuck 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 fuck, 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 fuck I fucking need to write this thing fucking hell fucking hell, and uh, and it, but I need that absolute pressure, you know, and and almost kind of anger. And hatred of myself to just go right, fuck it I'm doing this I'm saying that to get the focus it's almost like everything is swimming about until that moment and then I can focus it when the fear is at its ultimate yeah. at that point in time and I have got nowhere to hide I can't put it off for a minute longer at this point in time because I will always always put it off put it off so I get I mean for anybody listening who does <laughs> suffer from this or suffers from am I good enough even the, the, the DNA D president is feeding these <laughs> things just before it it's okay yeah it's but fine. in terms of like what how would you do that differently in an ideal world as some like as a, uh, you know the, the the really stupid thing is I could have just spoke to somebody do you know what I mean everybody was offering help you know the um Donald at DNAD, Joe at DNAD, we're like, let's just sit down, we'll get some notes together. But I'm like, no, 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 you know, I have to do it, you know, um, or I, I, I don't want to expose to you how fucking stupid I am. Right, is that <laughs> you know? what's behind it? Yeah, yeah, and um, whereas I'm better exposing it to a couple of them <laughs> than exposing it to 2,000 people. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you it's know? very true. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, and that takes confidence, and I'm like, uh, and every time I'm like, why didn't I just speak to somebody about it, walk about, do the process I go through, which is walking about, walking about, talking about it, talking about it out loud, and then capturing some notes to be able to structure the writing that I need to do. Mm. Um, but it's always in retrospect, and it's always after I've fucking done it and I've been through the the absolute mill um, that I remember. To do that, I'll need to listen to this podcast to yeah, remind to myself to it, yeah. <laughs> what to do. Yes, <laughs> that, that, you know that's, that's kind of a, a human thing to a degree. Some people have that process where they're very organised uh, things. I'd say Charles is very organised. He's very ahead of, ahead of schedule. Yeah, Whereas, I'm so jealous of that. <laughs> it's right. not same here. It's not necessarily the the best skill that I have. Yeah, I again react on pressure a bit better sometimes, not all the time. Yeah, but I can handle that that window of pressure, mm -hmm. you know, that moment before you get on and you're finishing things off. Yeah. So we all have a different, we all have a different processes. Yeah. But in retrospect, we realise sometimes that we could have given ourselves more time or more, less pressure by yeah. being more prepared. Yeah, it's time. like, you know, I was like totally kicking myself. I'm like, if I had had these written in advance, I could have gone to see Peter Savile speaking. Yeah. You know, I could have gone to see some of the talks. I could have walked around and enjoyed it, you know. Um, and that's the sort of thing I do a lot. As a, I then regret that I didn't enjoy the the whole the whole thing because I've put so much pressure on myself to do it at the last minute. And I worry that if I don't go through that process, it'll be boring, and it'll be kind of like half arsed or it'll be ninety percent 
Mm-hmm. Whereas if I go through the the the, the, extre- the extremity of it all, then I can then I can hit some of the notes that I want to hit, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I feel that if I've if I've put it down and I've had a chance to relax, it's it's going to be boring, you know. For the last piece on this, I think what might be helpful is because some people might also go, oh, okay, I've got to ask for help. Like, I don't want to say, like, hi, can you help me? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm know, so pathetic. That might be going something through something. Completely. Head. Even yeah, though that's you what can, you feel. and someone will be like, yeah, yeah. absolutely. But yeah. Is there like a simple line people could, if someone's listening to this and be like, flipping heck, I'm, I need to ask someone for help, <laughs> yeah. but I don't know what to say. Is there, yeah. What would you say? I know. I, I think I, I would, I would say, uh, can I run some thoughts past you? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Can I just run some thoughts past you because my head's swimming, nice. and and I could do a just an, a a bit of a, 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 a someone to bounce something off of, you know, just to clarify some of my thoughts, yeah. uh, rather than him to say, "Can you help me?" Because I'm a total clown. <laughs> uh, I've totally <laughs> arsed this up. I hate myself. Yeah. Uh, I'm, you know, all the rest of it. Because that's almost the thought that you think you have to say. That like, oh, okay, I can't take. I'm I know. Tell him I'm. Yeah, I have to tell him I'm. I'm this riot. Right, you know, I have to expose. Can I run some thoughts by you? Like, yeah. Right Which now. I'm wishing I had done the other night, rather than everybody backstage going, "What go. the fuck is this?" Not you know, yeah, like right. what the fuck. Seven words. Yeah, can Seven I run some thoughts words. by you? If you don't mind, and then folk will go, yeah, of course, you know, what I mean? like it's yeah. like who doesn't want thoughts run past them? Yeah, you know, everybody wants new thoughts. It's like yeah, it's like you know what have you got? Let's hear it, and then you're like, you know, how does that sound? And it's like, it, you know, actually sounded like you didn't know what you were talking about. So <laughs> let's uh, <laughs> try again, <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, you know, or there's a there's a couple of things there that you could fix. You know, it's never going to be as bad as you think. No, no. Well, talking of. Things that uh, are, are quite bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not for a doom and gloom <laughs> scenario, but this is part of your story. Yeah. So in 2009, uh-huh. you faced a life or death situation. Uh, yes, that's right. Talk us through what the situation was and what happened. So, yeah, so I had always had kidney disease from when I was a child. Mm. And um, I think I was about nine when I first got diagnosed with it. And, um, and, then I, I sort of managed it with a lot of medication and stuff when I was younger. Um, and then I got to about 18 and it got bad and I ended up, you know, hospitalised for quite a lot of that year. Um, uh, so I tried to work out what it was, what the kidney disease was, what I could do about it. And um, so then uh, uh, the condition that I had was called glomerular nephritis. A oh, bit of a mouthful. Mm. And, um, and then from then I just sort of looked after it with... Uh, medic- medication injections, stuff like that, you know, and the the whole plan is that you can try and keep your kidneys going as long as possible. Mm-hmm. So they, which the hospital team did a brilliant job of, and I got to uh, thirty nine, mm-hmm. uh, and they were like, oh, right, it's time, you know, you you need you're going to need this transplant. Wow, and so you um, need another kidney. Basically. Yeah, it's yeah. So it was like, right, it's it's coming, and uh, and I had always, I was always so fortunate that. I had a brother, um, and my brother was a good match, um, for for a transplant. You know, mm-hmm. that we had similar genes, and you can you can have a full brother, a full sister, but they're not maybe not the best match. Mm-hmm. So it's it's kind of like your luck if your uh, genetics are right. It, you, you can there's medic there's enough medication now, and medication is a lot better that you can have not a full match, and you manage it with um, anti rejection drugs. Right. Um, but what getting my brother uh, Robert's kidney meant for me that he was a good match and that gave me the best chance did you would you remember having that chat with him be like yo bro <laughs> I just need something for it. can I run some thoughts by you uh, <laughs> might need your kidney um, I remember we'd all we'd kind of like always talked about it when when we were young um, and and I'd be like you know I'm maybe going to have to cash in uh, on this you know and, um, and I had an older sister as well but you know she sort of became quite estranged from her family over the past uh, 20 years sadly um, so I knew it was down to my brother that was um, it <laughs> yeah. And he, yeah and I mean he was he had gone he'd gone to Australia at the time when the doctors were like right now's the time he'd just gone <laughs> the furthest off, place I you know he'd just gone off on like this two year t- travelling event uh, travelling adventure you know with his with his uh, partner uh, Pam and, and I phoned him like the first like week I think he was there no. <laughs> he just bought this camper van and I was like ah, Rob uh, guess what and he's like what and I'm like 
I'm going to need the kidney. I need your kidney. Can you come back? And he was just like, <laughs> he was just like, oh, for fuck's oh, sake. <laughs> He's like, ah, you know, I've just bought this fucking beautiful camper van. And, uh, and um, anyway, the doctors were like, ah, look, if he's just got there, we can pump you full of more medication. He's like, ah, we'll string it out, we'll string it out. If it has to, you can start dialysis. Um, give him his, give him the 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 time. Yeah. And Last so, bit of fun I'll have with him and his kidney. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you yeah. mean? It was like, so take that kidney on a tour around Australia. Yeah. Show it about and get yeah. some sun. Get, get, yeah. get, make yourself feel really good. Get you know, get full of vitamin D, and then come back and give me that kidney. And so that's what we did. So we, I, I kept my, I kept going without without it. And then he got back, and then we went straight in. Wow. And uh, and that how was long it. were you waiting before you got back? Um. Oh, they they had it lined up for when he was getting off his flight. So really, two, was he there for two years? Aye, he did his he did his oh, two, he years. Did two years. Yeah, he did the two years. These... Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So they kept they kept going with me, and it was like because you're trying to get to a point that you you need to be in good enough health to be able to receive the kidney. Right. Do you know what I mean you can't be like that di- dying and then you get yeah. the kidney? Do you know what I mean because then it's it's not got any chance. No. You know you're 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 gone beyond all hope at that point in time. So it was like a real fine balancing act, and the, my kidney team did an amazing job with amazing. with me. You know, they kind of go, right, you're at 20% of function, you need the kidney. Right, you're at 15% of function, you need the kidney. Right, you need it now, you're at 14%, you're at, you know, you're at 11%, you, you need it now, sort of yeah, thing. Okay. So they they did it and, you know, you he, came, kidney. Yeah, he came skidding in, that. saved the day. Love that. And so you what what you go back to work after you got the new kidney. Yeah. What's your condition when you're at work? Are you walking around sort of? Uh, I'm kind of like, I mean, when I got this kidney, I mean, Andy, who's getting a kidney transplant, it is absolutely amazing. You know, it's like, you know, like absolutely life saving, life changing. And um, but I had sort of thought I would get, I'd get this plugged in battery, and I would somehow be like, you know, like pure Duracell up, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, but not, you know, like leaping around the room and like, you know, and it was like, my God, I just felt so shit. Really? Like, yeah, I was like. Yeah, I remember after it, I said to my brother, like, we couldn't even, like, speak to each other after it. We were so, like, what the fuck just happened? Wow. Yeah, we were so floored by it. But um, I was going back to work, like, um, trying to go back to work, like, two days a week. But you, you, it's really hard when you're creative director of, of a team of people, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And when you take responsibility the way I do, you know, it's like the problem is mine. You know, I need to look after these people. I need to take pressure off of them. So I find it really hard to go back two days a week you know I'd just be like I was just back and try, trying to you know deal with the problem deal with the problems you know it was like a tidal wave just coming at me you know and um and so I, I tried that and I was, I was sort of doing two days a week three days a week four days a week but when you're doing five days a week you're already doing eight days a week so when you're yeah. doing two days a week you're doing five and yeah. you know it's like you don't switch if you're someone like me you don't switch off from it and um and I got back and I was back a, a month or two and I just thought, I don't know. I just thought, you know. Well, something happens here, doesn't it? Yeah. So at some point around this year, around this time of your story, yeah. another colleague isn't feeling too well. That's right. And um, uh, my pal, he was like, he he was running a team. Yeah. And then he was like, uh, you know, had enough of it. He just like had enough of it. It was just too stressful. And, and so he sort of, step back from uh from running the team and it was like to give him a bit of space so then all of his team was coming into my team oh wow and i was like double load i was like fucking hell i can't i so was like, i'm struggling mean, enough that would mean you were taking on more projects more people to manage yeah, I, and I, you were already struggling. I, I was struggling you know i wasn't telling him i was struggling at this point mm. in time i'm trying to style it out you know and then i just thought i, I just thought fuck that <laughs> i'm not doing it and i was like um yeah, I just sort of felt like right at this moment in time, this this additional pressure and shit is just coming in my direction, and I'm just going to take I'm just going to take it because that's just what I do, and um and I thought or I could just not take it, mm. and I was like and I just thought you know what fuck it I'm going to resign I'm going to resign right this minute. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't plan anything at all. I just thought no, that's it. So what did yeah. you do? Well, my old boss had always said, 
the best ideas work on a post-it note. So I just wrote on a post-it note. I resign. Dear Greg, I resign. Put it on his desk. <laughs> that is simple as that. That was it. Yeah. And then he just was like, shut up. You know, we're having a laugh and all this. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm going. And then, then it was like, come on, you know, we'll talk about this and all the rest of it. But I didn't want to talk about it. Mm. Uh, the, the, the mist was down by this point in time yeah. and naively I should have talked about it because as I probably talked about it yeah, what am I actually going to do in my life and he's yeah. like well, what are you going to do and I'm like going yeah, genuinely no clue and I'm in going in your mind you're going yeah, oh, I don't have any idea yeah, yeah. I don't have any idea but yeah, I've got to say something and I'm like I'm going to set up my own agency <laughs> and he's like ah, where are you and I'm like ah. and he's like well what are you going to call it then and I was like pure <laughs> panic 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 uh, Jerry studio obviously <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, I uh, when when he's setting up, I'm like, no." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was like, "All right, let's see it then." And I'm like, "Okay," but I had a three months notice period. Okay, so I was like, "Right, okay," and then uh, so I did the three, I had to do the three months notice period, you know, finishing projects, letting clients know all the rest of it. And the whole time I'm like. There's no fucking way I'm setting up an agency. <laughs> I was like, no. And then I was like, oh no. And then it's as it was coming to it, and I was like, I'm going to have to look like I'm actually doing this. Mm. Like to leave, you know, leave yeah. with like keep face. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. So folk were like, well, where, where's your agency going to be? And I'm like, uh, uh, King's Cross, probably. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> fucking being shit up. You know, like, oh, what, what sort of agency is he going to be? And Brandon, obviously. You know, like pure, why? Oh, are you going to have any staff? don't know we'll see all this you know like if you're going i am leaving here and i'm going to hide in a cupboard because <laughs> all the while you're answering these questions you've got no intention of doing this no no way wow i'm like how the fuck do i know how to set up an agency i don't know anything about it i've been like working at this agency for 13 years everything mm. is you, you know not that everything's done for you but you know you know if i want a cup of tea like there is tea there's tea in a cupboard if I, you know if I you know need to go to a meeting you know somebody will book a cab if I, you know clients come in the door yeah. it's not my job to get business mm. it's my job to you know make them come back mm. <laughs> not my job to find them you know so I don't know shit about running an agency so I'm like everybody's like you know what's your logo going to be like what's your logo going to be like I'm like I don't know don't know yet I've, 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 I've got I've got three months Two months. I've got one week. <laughs> I've got two days to worry about. <laughs> you know, I love so. You're thinking I'm going to go what? Curl it, well, I just thought you know, I'll I will leave here. I'll go and hide in a cupboard. Nobody will have a clue. They'll I'll have left this role. You know, which you know it was a big role. You know, creative director of this epic fucking respected agency. And once I go, I'll just go and hide. Then nobody will be able to see that I've gone and done shit work elsewhere mm. and I'll sort of keep my I'll keep face, I'll keep my reputation I'll keep this standard of work that I have created here, mm. I don't want to go somewhere and then I'm producing shitty work and that's now my new reputation as the producer of shit, mm. you know <laughs> so I thought if I hide in a cupboard it'll not matter, folk will just forget that I ever existed anyway and they'll not be challenged or asked anything by anybody And as you left this this job you said it felt like a complete and utter career suicide Oh God, yeah, it it really it, it really did think that, and as as the time was coming, you know, and it's like, you you know, because you get nasty like judge things and interviewed on this, and mm. you know, get involved in all of this stuff because that's the role that you're in. You know, you're the creative director of this fucking amazing agency whose work is incredible and winning yellow pencils out their arse. Do you know what I mean? It's like you know, <laughs> um. And when you're like, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, you're walking away from this, you know, like a kind of almost like, not quite a celebrity, but you know, like you're, status. you've got status, you know, no. like you're, you're known in the industry mm. because of that agency and the, the work that they do. And then I just felt like, you know, I'm just jumping off a cliff here in a total obscurity. And that's me. I'm finished. And so, and and you thought nobody would really care, you know, once you left who you were. Is is that what happened? It's just the phone stopped ringing. No, it didn't stop ringing. Mm. What happened? It started ringing more. Oh no! Way. Yeah, yeah. Because folk were a bit kind of like, how fucking dare a woman go and set up an agency? We need to find out about this. Yeah. What year you was know? this roughly? This was uh, 2012. 2012. Okay. 2012. 2012 yeah. yeah. It was almost like folk were like mystified, like what. 
Mm. And women were on the edge of saying, no, we've got to see this. We've got to see this joke. You know, all yeah, the yeah. Time. we need to talk to her. What so who, what kind of people are calling you? Um, There's more people like kind of wanting to interview me, like design press and uh, stuff like that, kind of like going, right, okay, what is the plan? What is the plan? People were curious, you know, sort of like, like, what are you doing? Why have you walked away from this this job? What happened? Were you fired? That's all everybody wanted to know. Mm. Were you fired? Were you fired? Yeah. You know, what happened? Did you leave? Did you jump or were you pushed? You know, yeah. scandal, you know, tell us all about it. And I was just like, oh, no, nah, just resigned. Just, just wrote on a post, didn't I? Yeah. No, I just resigned. And they were like, oh, why? Why? And I was like, oh. there was no why. I was no. like, oh, I just felt, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. I don't want to have to deal with somebody else's shit and everybody else's shit. Mm. And I'll just deal with my own shit for a wee bit. And uh, and and folk folk couldn't accept that though. They're like, no, there has to be a there has to be a big drama. There has to be a big re- a big reason. It's quite a contrast from working in an agency or for you know an organisation to yeah. going out on your own. Yeah. You know, many would see that as a track you kind of start with earlier in life, whether you're going to be an entrepreneur or whether you're going Absolutely. to be a career track person. Uh, you don't do it at 40 with a kidney transplant. <laughs> uh, when you're like, <laughs> try to drag your body around one meeting to the next sort of thing, you know. So uh, well, the, the press and stuff is nice and well, but did anybody call you up to do some work? Yeah, well, um, I was on a, you know, like, couldn't... What compete. Couldn't, yeah, mm. yeah, couldn't work for any clients but also I didn't really want to work for any other clients part of the reason I was leaving was I was bored anyway yeah. so I wasn't like you know oh I'm totally riveted by all these clients and I can't wait to get on the phone to them you know I was a bit sort of like let's see what else happens so I knew yeah. and, um, but I did have a project to start with when I finished on the Friday I knew I was starting on the Monday oh, with excellent. a project yeah. um, and it was a, a client that I had I had brought into the partners and then they had called to say they had another project. And I said to the partners, do you want this? And then they said, no, there's, there's, there's got fuck all money. You know, <laughs> so, um, and I said, right, well, when I leave, can I, could I do it? Would you mind? And they were like, ah, no, take it. It's shit. <laughs> you can have it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yes. and, uh, but that gave me some reassurance that there was something. Right. You know, that I, I was leaving to go to something. So I was less terrified on that Friday night doing my leave and do, mm. going, knowing that I was starting on that Monday morning. And did it take another year to f- get more clients? Was it a struggle, or did it pick up? Um, it picked up. It picked up fairly quickly, actually. You know, but I was really, really cautious, re- really cautious of what way? what I was doing. Um, I sort of felt like to start a, 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 you know, you're like, right, what do you invest? Do you know what I mean how how do you know if you're going to get any business, any clients? How do you start a company? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, I didn't want to start by going, I'll get a massive bank loan in a fancy office and, you know, some cool, you know, a reception desk and, like, pretend, you know, that I've got this massive agency. It was just me. and um, But I had then also stopped being able to really be on the tools by that point in time, you know, mm. directing for so many years that you're just sort of pointing at other people, yeah. to tell, ask, not telling them what to do, asking them politely, yeah. could you please do this? Um, and... Uh, so I needed an intern, like immediately, mm-hmm. somebody who could use a computer. And I had I had asked my husband who had a studio, he runs an animation studio, could I get a desk in his studio? And he said aye for £200. And, uh, <laughs> Your said, husband at the time? Or your uh, no, he was my boyfriend. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know, can you believe I married him after that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he said I could have a desk, it was £200 a month. And I was like, brilliant. So I gave him this £200 a month. And then I had, there was me and one chair. And then I got another chair and I pulled that up at my desk and brought an intern in. And I was like, to Chris, still one desk, <laughs> 200 pound. And, uh, and he was like, ah, fuck. And I was like, that's what you said, 200 pound. Deal was a deal. Deal was a deal. Yeah. So then I got another intern in, sitting on the other side of the desk. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then I got another one. So then at one point in time, there was five of us all on this one desk. And I'm like, 200 pound, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was just five of us all squashed on this desk we all, all with laptops I think just doing our work but I was too too scared to employ anyone you know because you're like you, you know I didn't have uh, retainers and you know clients mm. that I could rely on and stuff and when people when you're when you're hiring somebody it's such a, a responsibility because yeah. they might be moving to London and and taking on rent in a, a 12 month lease or something like that in a, yeah. in a flat and I felt 
really the weight of that responsibility. And so I had to keep saying to folk, look, you know, I would love to offer you a job, but I can't do it on uh, the terms that you need, which mm. is, you know, like a, a 12 month contract. So it took me probably about a year to be able to offer the first person the first job, even though I had amazing interns that mm. were kind of slipping through my hands, you know, who were brilliant and were so brave. These these young women coming to work for me, and on this type on this desk, you know, we you know with no business at all, you know what I mean? And they they sort of came down, you know, p pitched up beside me, gave it their all, and they were absolutely brilliant. Did you have to ask their shoulder width when interviewing them to make sure they? <laughs> no, did. honestly, it was like totally like. No you know, shoulders. it's like you need to be really comfortable um, being, you know, like really within t touch and distance of somebody else. And they were like, it's fine. Nobody's worried. They were like, right, we'll just squish in here then, you know. But by the sixth person, Chris was like, right, fuck off. Like, mm. get out. You need to get your own studio. <laughs> it was like, it's like, I can't get the door shut. He's like, you've got more people here now than we have. And that's what he was like, get out. So he booted me out and I had to get my own space. So, I mean, it's brilliant. So you, yeah, you go from quitting and having no plan and answering on the spot, I'm going to start this studio and naming it on the spot. On yes. the start the studio. And you actually went and did it. Yes. And it's still to this day. <laughs> what's that? 12 years later. 12 years, uh -huh. Called Jack Rennick Studio. I know. <laughs> Keep thinking I'd have a rebrand at some point in time. No. But then I'm like, I haven't got time. Who's got, no, you know what I mean? Like, who's got time, time for that? It's a great story. You, know, you can't get rid of that I story. can't. And I, I don't have a website. I've never had a website. Um, really? Yeah. But which is stupid, stupid, stupid. Um, you know, but I also was like really, not arrogant, but I just sort of thought, you know, because I get so crippled about what to write about stuff, you know, like, I can't, you know, I'm like, I haven't even updated my LinkedIn profile to say I'm the president of DNAD, do you know what I mean? It's like, I've been in the job like seven months and I'm like, what would I say? What would I say? So when it comes to um, writing up case studies on projects and stuff, I just, I, I thought I can't have a website because I don't know what to say. And um, which my staff go absolutely fucking bananas about. Yeah. And they're like, you know. So when so it's like, send us your website, you're like, don't have one. Yeah, it's just a holding page with some stripes on it. Uh, and it's like, you know. Well, you do you. You yeah, do your thing. You know, it's working. Mean? That's the key I'm like, thing. Do, do you need, and then I'm like, do you need one? And I'm totally convincing clients, you must have a website. <laughs> and you must pay us to build this website for you. You know, And they're like, oh, why have you not got one? And I'm like, oh, just too busy. <laughs> <laughs> so what's happened in that? In that, in that 12 years, where are things at today? Mm. Like, if we just fast forward to today, the contrast, what's what's happened? Uh, what kind of clients have you got? What kind of work are you doing? And um, Well, well, just now, <laughs> I've probably done this, the stupidest thing I've ever done. And I can't remember if I told you is that I bought a holiday park. Oh, yes. I bought a holiday park where? In Scotland, which is probably not the best thing for you running a design agency no uh, no no it's not a good idea um i thought it was a good idea at the time and um i had during lockdown uh you know everybody was like doing work from home and all mm. that kind of stuff but i ended up having to do like shielding like you know proper shielding and that was like where you couldn't go out the house so um like kidney transplant patients were like the top of the covid oh, risk right. list okay. um you know so it was like you know, we were like the most sort of vulnerable. I mean, it was, you, you know, it was like you will fucking die if you, <laughs> yeah. if you someone know, sneezes. But exactly, a mile, you know, what I mean? like you will finished. die immediately. You know, yeah. and it was like Christ. You know, so, um, you know, so my my instruction was, you know, to stay in, um, couldn't go out, do, couldn't do the walk, you couldn't, I could wasn't allowed in my garden. Oh my god! I was god. like, you know, I, I I could open my window, um, a little bit. <laughs> Luxury. I know. It's like wow, what a treat, and um, you know, but like for an hour. And then shut the window. Were you there, sort of like next to it, you know, like try to look out onto the street, fresh you know, air. yeah, like, wow. um, um, but yeah. So I ended up uh, being in this room for like fifteen months, and my husband Chris just put um, food outside the door for no fifteen way. months. Uh, Whoa! And um, yeah, so you know, he'd he'd just put every meal out the door, wipe the handle, I'd come out, you know get the meal, take it into the room, eat the room, 
eat, eat the room, eat the you know, <laughs> <laughs> fucking you freeze well, fucking <laughs> <laughs> losing my mind. But I was so busy. Do you know what I mean? I was just so busy, and I was running the agency, and everybody's on Zoom and everything. Like that. And they started going back into the studio and stuff like that, you know. And you know, we did what everybody did. You know, it's like quizzes on a Friday night, and mm. you know, dress up parties and what all the rest called? of it. Um, that nobody oh. uses now. Oh yeah, house party. House, house party. Oh God, house party totally. Yeah, oh. where you could have wee side conversations and all that yeah. sort of stuff. And uh, and the team were brilliant, it, and they really supported me through through all of that. You know, because they knew that I, like I was stuck and I couldn't go. So um, what your plan was buy a holiday park and then well, a no, whole I had park no plan. instead of a room to play. <laughs> yeah, to I think I, had, I think I didn't realise quite the effect that it had on me. I just thought I'm fucking just getting on with it. You know what I mean? It's like if I'm working here and working in the studio, what does it matter? If, you know, clients' problems are the same problems, and we've got to just find a way forward. And um, what's the big idea? Still hard on my team. You know, like <laughs> is this good enough? You know, um, but so I, I think I think it came kind of like a. It came crashing on me when I when I got out, and um and I, you know, when I was first allowed out, I went up to Scotland, and I thought I've got want to see my mum, and um but I still couldn't interact with anybody at that point, you know, I was just kind of like got w- wave, through, through you know, give wave through the window, so I mean everybody was back to normal by then, mm. you know, but I had to be quite cautious, so I'm like, hi hey, mum, and then I went up uh, to Argyll, and me and me and my husband Chris had thought we should probably buy a, a house up here because all during lockdown. We felt so useless to our parents that, you know, we couldn't help in any way. And we thought, well, if there's going to be another lockdown, it'd be better if we had a house up here. We thought, we'll buy a little place. And so we thought, right, well, let's go over to Argyll and look for something. We've never been there before. We started to do recce. And we thought, you know, we'd buy somewhere, but it might take years to to find somewhere. And so we'd booked into an Airbnb. And then we were just sort of like on right move. And I was up late one night and this thing came on. Holiday park. Uh, yeah, we thought we would buy a house with some land, and at some point in time we could maybe run like a pop up campsite. Mm. So we don't have any kids, and we thought right, getting into a retirement would be quite nice if we could run a thing and people would come and it'd be a nice community mm. and that's, all that sort of thing, really you know. Nice. And we love camping and all this. And then this this thing was uh, on the was on the right move. And you think, oh, perfect. Yeah, so I thought, so I thought that's sort of like a campsite. Um, because the thing that I've enjoyed about the campsite was I thought people pack up their tent and then they take it with them and I don't need to worry about it. Mm. You know, I don't need to like go in and like do the laundry or, you know, anything like this. Yeah. And then when we saw this chalet park, everybody owns their own chalet and I thought, okay. well, they'll sort out their own laundry and they'll be doing their own sort of thing. We'll just buy the land. Mm. So, so this is, for anyone who, I don't know, different countries, they might not know what a holiday park is. It's a yeah. big bit of land. With a lot of houses in it. A lot of chalets. chalets. So this was a chalet park. That chalet we park. Yeah, so, so it was like a 30 acre. What's a chalet? Yeah, what is a what chalet? Is a what is a chalet? Chalet's like a, chalet. a sort of like a wooden hut, like a lodge. Okay, mm. right, lodges. Yeah. There we go, that's American. Like a wooden term. lodge. Lodges. Yeah. How many of them in this park? Uh, 44. 44. 44 lodges. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's a big space. And people would like book for a week or, a, or two well, weeks. Well, this is all owned, all the chalets are owned by private families. Okay, so people mm. buy Yeah, them. yeah. so they they buy them, they own them, and then they come and stay with, stay in them whenever they like. And then, um, well, restricted to 15 months a year, if there's anyone listening to this contract. And... Um, uh, and we thought, right, well, what, what we're buying is the land that they are all placed and they own they own the ground they sit on but we own the rest of it and our job right. our job is to cut the grass mm. cut the trees mm. cut all the bushes and I thought that'll be really brilliant for Chris and I's mental health mm. sort of coming from this cupboard to Nature. the side of yeah. Loch Fine we're right yeah. we're right on the Loch side you know they're looking at the water the water is just like sparkling it's gorgeous um, and a loch is a bit of water again might be a term yeah, yeah a loch is, is like a lake L O C H for anyone who doesn't. Yeah, know. lock, yeah. and um, and lock finds like a sea lock, so it's got t- it's got a tide and makes it much more interesting. By the way, if you're if you're not English and you've got this far and understanding this <laughs> accent, yeah, well done. you've done really. I well. know. Fair I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to slow it down. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, sorry, carry on. Ah, uh, no, no. So we bought this. We bought this thing, and uh, thinking this will be the thing that's going to sort out uh, this new lifestyle for us will go up and then it's got some um, beautiful these old old barns that are, are you know they're a bit of a wreck and we thought we will convert those into a design studio 
Nice. And and I had thought I'm going to start a design school. I'm going to um, teach folk about design, about writing, about thinking. Chris mm-hmm. can teach them animation, illustration. We'll run, we'll run um, the school, and to pay for the school, we'll run creative retreats. Mm-hmm. And we thought we can get people up because we've got another big bit of land at the back of us. And we thought, oh, we'll we'll build a holiday, you know, like glamping pod type things, you know, yeah. off grid, fully sort of. Uh, back to nature, so I think, because the view and is co- absolutely stunning. You know, right. it's just like whoo, calming. It's like people come, they'll do some kayaking, cycling, walking, all this sort of shit. I'm getting that this does not end in a happy ending. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what happens? Well, well, it's all still ongoing actually. But um, I think what we probably didn't account for, and I'm sure there'll be people listening to this uh, podcast. You'll find it. Um, who and I don't know what we, you know, as soon as week one, week one, we were getting challenged on, on the whole sort of thing. So the length of the grass, is too yeah, long. you know, everything. Yeah. Don't cut my bush. Don't yeah, trim my trees. These are people who own chalets, yeah, these lodges yeah, in there. Going, yep. Yeah, you know I mean, and and you know, change is change, and I absolutely get it. You know, what I mean, the previous owners of this site uh, owned it for thirty years, and you know, lovely people, and um, you know, and me and Chris are coming up and. You know, I'm thinking we're so we're lovely people. I think we are. Do you know what I mean? We're nice folk. We care. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Really, yeah. really care. So part of my perfectionism, I'm like, that. Um, not only am I going to cut the grass, it's going to be incredible. I'm going yes, to, you grass. know, it's going to be the best grass cut thing MD's ever seen. They'll be mind blown. Yeah. Um, but it didn't turn out like that. The the time that we've ended up spending has actually been in a load of legal challenges. And um, so, oh, so, wow. So what yeah. Happened? So you just suddenly it's had the kinda, letter of the door and you're. Yeah, just kind of folk challenging whether we've actually had the right to buy it, whether legally. Oh, right. Then it turned out that the, the previous owner um, t- uh, sadly had killed himself, oh. and we didn't know that. And then um, then it's been challenged that whether his wife had the right to sell the park to us. Right. And, um, oh. and so now we're in uh, a ton of legal court cases. Which is really good for your mental health. Okay. Totally, yeah. yeah. Especially when uh, we've been charged by the police. Um, really? Yeah. What does that technically mean? You so you've been charged. So yeah. technically, are you a? Have we got a criminal in the building? Have we got? Not a, yet. What What does that mean? Um, well, it means that the police come to your door to to arrest you. Oh man. Which um. <laughs> With cuffs. Um. Yes. You got cuffed. No. Oh. oh. We went in. So thankfully, we came on a Friday night. We were down at the pub. Oh, you weren't in. We went in. Right. And um, and we could see them on our like you know like doorbell camera. <laughs> Whoa, that must have been and, quite a notification. And we were like, ah, you know, it's the coppers. Police at the door. What the fuck? <laughs> and um, and up and you're always like, fucking, what have I done now? Um, thinking, you know, some design relates. Yeah. <laughs> you, the designs you know, are so you know, bad. Know exactly. we're gonna you're so <laughs> shit. You're you know, it's, it's, it's actually criminal. So um. Um, so th- they put a car through the door. We phone the phone the police the next morning. We'll actually phone our lawyers. Their lawyers say you're going to need a criminal lawyer, and oh. they're like, "What's a criminal lawyer?" Yeah. And they're like, ah, "That's a different type of lawyer. They're litigation lawyers. You need a criminal lawyer." So we're going, "Em, do you know a criminal lawyer?" Um, and they put us in touch with a criminal lawyer. We phone this criminal lawyer. We're like, "What the fuck do we do?" Um, and he says, "I'll phone the police station." So he phones him and he says, "Right, you need to go and hand yourself in." at the police station and me and Chris are like is this for real and I'm from Glasgow right and I've avoided getting arrested all my life yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. do you know what I mean if I've ever was going to be arrested it would have been before I got out of Glasgow totally. you know not um, once I've moved to London you know by uh, and then uh, running a design agency blah 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 um, and now I'm you know poncing about owning this holiday park you know oh, what I mean wow. um, I did not think that would be the time in my life when I'd get arrested so we go they're under instruction to say no comment. Oh, the NC. Get, yeah, yeah, get to the police station. What? Okay, yeah. Yeah. And you, you Take go, through the back. No, but you say, hi, hi guys. Hi, yeah, I'm here to get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I'm not here to get arrested. You're here to get charged. Right. Okay. So that's that's the what we think. You're here to receive a charge. So then you have to go through the process of getting read your rights and then receiving oh, the charge. Right. Which was quite horrible. I thought yeah. I'm pure nails, but I ended up bursting into tears. Ah. Yeah, it was quite 
I, I was out of just total frustration, you know. Oh, yeah. I was like, I can't believe this is happening. I, Did you have to spend a night in the cell? No, no. That's good. No, they, let us, they, they, they just said, you know, um, read me the charge and then you need your response. And, and he okay. just said, our lawyer said to say no comment. Right. And uh, and I felt like I was on like an episode of like, you know, like, yeah, like 24 Juliet, hours you know, like Juliet custody. Bravo or something like that, you know, like, <laughs> you know. Um, so what you kind of think would be cool was actually just bloody horrible. Mm. You know, it was it was horrible. And um, I don't recommend them to get arrested. It's not right, good. Okay. And um, so, yeah, basically this is ongoing. This now. is ongoing. So it's exactly now been, a, now been two and a half years. Ooh. We've got seven court cases and we're waiting on the first ones getting called in the 24th of July. All right. Okay. Yeah. Not long now. Sounds yeah. like we need part three. Yeah. I know. And then uh, I've got a new criminal lawyer now, okay. Phil, and he's from where I'm from. Mm. And he is he is much more like, you're not a fucking criminal. <laughs> he's like, you've done no criminality. Yeah. Nothing, mm. you, it's not proven yet that you are running an illegal holiday park. That's, That's case number true. one. Yeah, right. And he's like, ah, you know, he said, so he's, he's saying, don't worry about it. Because it's a six month jail sentence. Really? Yeah. You know, yeah. So it's quite. Would a, that be three months on good behavior? Maybe. maybe, maybe. You don't want to go down that thought. You No, I know. Because I was thinking, that should be a laugh, saying to Dean AD. Have you ever had a president who served a term from jail? <laughs> and then and they were like, no, we haven't. And, uh, but. But, um, and we're tuning the president live from <laughs> no. the cell, 42. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, oh my fucking God. And uh, But he's he's told, he's like, ah, you know, you've not acted criminally in the slightest. Oh, he's no, like, ah, you know, no. the police have jumped the gun. They've arrest, arrested you before they decided whether, I you know, see. the first court case decides whether mm. we had the right to buy this thing or we'd not, or whether we've been running an illegal thing or not. So. Okay. He's like, don't worry about it. Wow. And he's like, you're not that cool. You're not going to jail. <laughs> no, no. Another time then. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think it's important for us to continue to nurture young, creative and diverse talent? Um, this is very passionate for me. Mm. I think um, I think coming from the, the background that I've come from, mm. uh, I remember doing my uh, acceptance speech for the DNAD president. And talking about being the accidental president mm. and how, you know, had I not bumped into some, eh, this guy Ed in a sports mm. shop, then I would not be standing on this this platform, you mm. know, having the chance to say thank you for voting me as the president of the DNAD. Wow, and I was funny. like, and so I said to the, you know, I just said, um, we cannot have the situation where folk are getting here by accident. You know, this needs to be better designed. And in the UK just now, uh, art in schools and state schools is getting massively cut. Like, there's no funding for it at all. It's not even on their agenda. You know, there is no... Firstly, no respect for any of that as, as an industry that anybody goes into. And then, therefore, no respect for anybody who teaches it. So, state schools, no funding... Nobody's the 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 get the teaching of art. I mean, can you imagine not getting taught art? Imagine there wasn't an art class. Oh Do you know yeah. what I mean? For young kids to express themselves, for kids that are maybe not fully academic and, mm. um, you know, rise up through, you, you know, being the top of their class at academic subjects, but might whose brain might work a little bit different. Yeah. And finds their way in the art class and that's the one class where they feel yeah. like a valued human being absolutely and they can and they can excel mm. you know and that has been stripped from uk state mm. schools um most mostly in england mm. um where they have a baccalaureate system and the that system counts points towards whether you're an outstanding school or a good school yeah. or a shit school and any schools that teach the art the art teaching doesn't even have any points what? that goes towards the the amalgamation. Calibrated. Yeah, right. how it's calibrated. You know, it's like they don't even count it. So, school, the head teachers are, are forced into a situation of like, well, what's the point of teaching it? Mm -hmm. I could put an academic class in that classroom, and that will at least go towards the points for them to mm -hmm. actually try and raise their school up, um, through the ranks to have more respect, um, better funding, all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So art is just dead. Wow. And what that means for uh, an industry like ours 
is all of those young children are not getting that fire lit. They're not mm. recognising that there, there is a pathway for them. They're not getting inspired at a young age to know that they could go on and have careers mm. in what I do and, you know, what you guys all do. And, you know, like you could be a writer, you could be a designer, you could be a filmmaker, you could be a games designer, you know, you could be a project manager, somebody who's super organised, a planner. You know, there's so many different careers in the creative industries that are then going to have no pipeline coming through from the UK. Mm. And then with Brexit, you can't hire from abroad. No. You can't bring anyone over unless you've got 20 grand to pay for a visa for somebody. You know, so our pipeline is cut off for talent from bringing people from overseas to help bring diversity and then from schools with diversity. And the only people who are then teaching art are private schools who recognise the value, the contribution that it actually brings to business. Um, and the person. And, and the, the person and society. And, and uh, you know, it's like, they're savvy enough to see it. Why is our government not savvy enough to see that that's what we need in state schools? And so we, um, a couple of friends and I set up a, a thing called the Creative Industry Alliance a few months back. And we wrote to the Tory government when they were setting their budget that you have to take this seriously, that we bring £115 billion to this economy. That's, that is a lot. It's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's all the creative industries together, what they're bringing. The, the, the visual creative industries. Just the Design, visuals. advertising. Right. Um, and that we are, are a valuable uh, asset to you, not only just from money, but from this, this country is always... Uh, had a creative reputation mm. and that pulls innovation to the UK and if we lose that you know all of the, the the companies who are coming here thinking that there is young creative people that they will be able to meet and find and nurture are not going to be here not there. you know so the agencies can't f find the diversity they, they need you know more and more it's not just white people that have got money now to spend you know all brands want to talk to everybody, there is a democratisation of finance and people having the power to spend and there's a dawning realisation that we need to actually speak to people who make spending decisions and that is everyone now, that's not just white, rich white folk, mm. you know, who had all the money mm. um, now everybody can decide and brands need to be able to speak to everybody and they can't speak authentically to the majority of audiences if they haven't got people who have lived experience from those backgrounds and who understand the needs of those audiences. It's like we can pretend and we can do a lot of research and, and you know, research is good and you're always doing focus groups, you're always getting that voice and that input. But we need the real people who have done that in our agencies to be able to show us what thinking and appropriate thinking is in that world. Mm. And if they are not getting taught art from a, being a child and we're not in those schools telling those children, telling their parents, telling the teachers about all these amazing careers that they can have, then they just won't be coming into the creative industry. They'll go into, they'll go into other industries. Other mm. industry will benefit from it and we will lose. We'll be the ones who lose out. Yeah. And so we, we wrote to the Tories going, right, you, need, you need to refund this. You need to bring funding back for art in schools got anybody we could think of who, to sign it, you know, from fashion, mm -hmm. from uh, animation, from film, advertising, design, every big wig that we could possibly get an email for or get a phone number for, we contacted, said, will you sign this letter on behalf of children of the UK who need your help to fucking be taught art and be taught be allowed to be creative and be seen valuable to our society if you're creative and everybody fucking signed it mm -hmm. and we sent it to the Tories How many signatures on there? We didn't go for quantity we ended, we ended up with about 5,000 but we didn't go for quantity we went for you know we went for who are they, whose name are they going to read that they're going to recognise yeah. you know yeah. and it was like big wait. names yeah wait in their mind and um, and that they might have heard of that might be famous you know mm. and um you know, we, as as predicted, we got like an utterly no response. You know, like that that was sort of what we expected. You know, and now 
our conversation has been with the Labour Party. And last week we had a meeting with the Creative Industry Alliance and the the Creative University Alliance. Mm. And we've set up a thing, the Creative Education Alliance, together. Okay. Cool. So we phoned, um, we had a call with uh, Chris Bryant, who is the shadow, Labour shadow minister for Creative Industries mm -hmm. last week and got him told what we were all about, what we need, what we need from Labour, uh, what we need funded, and he's listening. Nice. And it's like Labour have been listening and it has been really encouraging over the past few months. Keir Stammer, uh, Keir Stammer, <laughs> Keir Stammer sna stammered, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, talked about it um, on on the news the other week. Really? He talked we, about this, what you're talking about um, No, he, t he talked about... Them the importance of creativity to mm. the UK. And we were, you know, he, he, I'm like, he gets it. They get it. They know that it is valuable to the UK. They know how much money that's bringing in, how valuable that is. And we're like, you know, when they, they, you know, Keir Stammer's on the TV talking about it and we're all going bananas in the background going, like, fucking yes! <laughs> you know, like, yes, yeah. come on! And it's like, you know, somebody who, who values what we do. And it's like, you know, so we need as many of us you know, to to be getting out there, spreading the word, talking to anybody with children, um, to anyone who teaches, uh, to be encouraging their school and putting pressure on their school to be teaching it. Right. You know, yeah. that their children deserve to be taught creativity and have the opportunity and the chance to, to be themselves and not have to fit this academic mould. Mm. And, um, you know, and that's what, uh, that's what our agenda is now. If someone's listening to this and they're like, yes, Jack, yes. I'm, I love this. You're so right. What, what do we do? What do we do what before do I, our pipeline is fucked, what, basically? What, what, what do I, if I'm listening to it, what do I do? Can I sign up to something you're doing? Um, so we are working on um, some materials to launch a program called Adopt a School. And we want... Great name. <laughs> we want... Uh, you know, indiv creative agencies are just made up of passionate people who give a shit. Mm. And they give a shit about being able to create great ideas for their clients. And they know that they need, those great ideas need to come from, from unusual places. And so we want them to be able to work with a local school. And you can do that with as little or as much effort as you've got time for. And the plan will be that you can go in, you could spend an hour and just light people's imagination that there is these great creative careers out there for folk who might think a little bit differently, who enjoy um, writing poems, uh, you know, drawing pictures, coming up with ideas, singing, dancing, doing all of this stuff, um, that there is careers and you are valuable. So and good. educate them on that to try and light that fire. Or they could set a brief, they could, you know, set a project and come back and see them a couple of weeks later, you know, of creating whatever it is that they think that child in that classroom would benefit from, that the, that the teacher might think they're, they're, they're missing. Or they could fully adopt a school and be going in and, you know, catching up with them on, you know, a month-by-month -month basis, checking in how they're getting on, go back and just reminding them, reminding them that uh, creativity is cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and everyone, the weirder the better is welcome, you know. So how do, if I'm like, yeah, let's adopt a school, how mm -hmm. do I do, oh, that's what you're working on? Yeah, now. that's what we're working on. Right how, now, right now, fuck knows how uh, we're, <laughs> we're going to do it. Oh, we're talk, that's, that's we're just talking to schools and talking to, and, you know, the design council has, has been amazing. Um, the, the design, the DBA, the Design Business Association, DNAD, uh, the Design Museum, uh, everybody, everybody who's in creativity knows and gets it that, this is such importance to our industry and to our society. So everybody wants to be on board. So should, if someone wants to get on board with what you're doing, do yeah. they email you, sign up to a newsletter or? Yeah, if anybody is interested in getting involved with any of this, who gives a shit about our future pipeline, um, you can email me or you can check out the Creative Industry Alliance website and there'll be an email on that. You can also sign our petition on that as well um, and let your voice get heard that you're not happy about it. And uh, 
hopefully there's a new general election has just been announced yesterday, 4th of July, Independence Day, independent of fucking misery <laughs> and fucking, you know, shackles and absolute failure to do anything for our country. So hopefully we'll be independent of that very soon. You should run, run with that message. <laughs> We'd have the best posters, yeah. <laughs> the best comfy, yeah, the best co- <laughs> colourful and uh, eye catching. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Maybe all designers and creatives should uh, think of any politics. Mm. You know, maybe they're the folk who usually care the most and they're very passionate about things. So. Totally. <laughs> totally. Any any final words? Final words. I just think it's. I think the the thing that I really resonate with is the importance of supporting young people into creativity. Mm-hmm. I was lucky that the, the upper school I went to at the time, secondary school now, it had a lot of issues, a lot of like wild stuff going on. But my music teacher, she wasn't even my music teacher when I was going into sixth form, but she said, you're doing music. I think you should come and study music and, and music technology. It's our new, mm-hmm. it's our new um, course. I said, okay. Then she said, you're going to have to learn some music theory, but you know, you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. So they got onto that and I was able to cultivate that in, in sixth form. And Brilliant. I never forget when she waved me off after we got our results and she just said, fly, you're going to do great. I never forget her face. Yeah. And I think it's really important to keep those fires lit so early because yeah. I now do work with young people that have been excluded, mm-hmm. that then we're taking them through multimedia. And to see them that have been excluded, you know, almost given up on, Here's some lights. So you want to do some photography? Here's some lights. Here's a backdrop. And then for two hours, she was just in her element. I didn't have to say a word. Mm. So rewarding to see that because it again, it it makes that that fire lights the pyre yes. that can allow them to see. I could actually do this. Yeah, I could actually earn from this. I could build something yeah. in my life from it. And without those those points of exposure, they just never know. Yeah, you know. Well, let's say that their their chances of moving into the creative industry are very very slim. And so it's that 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 is so true, because it's, with a creative career, I think there's, um, and I don't know why, but it's not seen as a respected career, mm. and parents feel that their kids would begin into something where they're like, ashing about, mm. or colouring in, or you know doing something that is not going to be this respected, lucrative career, and it's like. You can earn a lot of money yeah. in the creative industries. You can travel the world. Yeah. You can be working with amazing artists and designers, doing anything that you want that that um, that, that comes from your heart and soul. Mm. But I think there's a our government doesn't do anything to raise the level of respect for it, as well as cutting the funding off at the knees. It's um, if parents, you know, and particularly parents of um, um, say particularly Asian families mm. you know and a lot of kids are pushed to go into academic subjects like medicine and law because it does bring respect mm. and when and if you're uh, not welcome often in a society mm. going into those professions brings respect to that family mm. and so allowing your child to go into the creative professions um, is worrying for a yeah. lot of parents and, and that puts a lot of pressure on kids so I have utter respect for any kids from any black Asian backgrounds who have gone against even their parents mm. to find their path in creativity. It's like it's, it, has, it takes so much bravery because, you know, not only have you got societal pressure, but you've got parental pressure to, mm. you know, try and fit a mould of respectability. And, um, you know, but so parents is, is the goal that we need to change the minds of yeah. and allow their children to get into that, you know, but if it's not getting taught in the first place, the parents won't know and they won't see that it, what, what is possible. So we've got a big job to do on, on all of those fronts, you know, but that's going to start with putting some funding back into schools mm-hmm. so that teachers are not having to buy their own pens and papers to be able to teach art. Yeah. It's an absolute joke. So, <laughs> you know, bring some cash. Totally. <laughs> what a great message to end on. And, uh, and yeah, just very admirable what you're what you're doing. You ke- clearly, yeah, care about it. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's 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 beneficial for all if this is if this is progressed. Let's say. Yeah. Thank you. 
thank you. It is. It's uh, you know, you're not going to get uh, the future DNAD president coming from uh, a high rise flat. If we don't, they'll be just coming from Chelsea again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So um, we get to that stage where we Ash is going to share a poem um, about your life based on what we've been speaking about today and he's written it again as we go okay i'm going to share a final piece i think what people can summarize one of the things people can learn from your story i think um just that tenacity you've got that if you see something you want to do or see something that needs to change you just get into this mode of like right i'm gonna make this happen yeah. no matter what i'm gonna make it happen yeah you've got it because like, nobody's going to do it for you. And genuinely, I've, I've had to learn the hard way that if you don't ask, you don't get. And it's like, you know, and it's very hard to ask when you don't come from a background who who gets, mm. you know. And uh, and it's really hard to, to find the confidence to ask, you know. But genuinely, there's people not as good as you asking and getting. And it's like, so if you don't, they're, they're, they're fucking having it all. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, get out there and take the deep breath and, and, and ask for it and go. take it and go get it. Totally. <laughs> There's some, some inspiration for people listening. I love that. Poem time. Poem time. Uh oh. <laughs> <clears throat> Subtle suggestion a key lesson in capturing people's eyes. Honesty being the best policy to turn around the client's success and make surprise. To live in the client's world, the key to win the minds. Just make sure you do your homework. Make sure you take the time. 80% is better than nothing. Your team can help you find the rest. Remembering this simple fact can give you balance and reduce the stress. Absolute pressure creates great diamonds to so keep blinging all cool creatives. The arts are important to our industry's future, so let's unite together and continue to shape it. Brilliant. Thank you. That's awesome. Welcome. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one bonus piece, actually. What have you got on your hand? Sorry, I wasn't on the mic. <laughs> um, for anybody that doesn't recognise this, this is the DNAD yellow pencil. And what's the, the significance of that for anybody who doesn't know? Uh, this is the significance of ultimate recognition and achievement for a piece of creative work that you have done and all of your peers, not all of them, but a room full of judges have deemed that your work has risen above all others to receive this. They are very, very rare. And... Uh, and You're competing... And I'm not giving this back. <laughs> <laughs> You're competing with people around the whole world, mm. yes. all the creative industries. Yeah, this the is the best a... work. And if you get one of those, there's pretty much a stamp that yeah, you're the best in the world at this. this yeah, year. absolutely. That's epic. That is um, that is a, a huge, huge uh, achievement to get that. Even to get a like a graphite is um, where your work is absolutely awesome, awesome, awesome. But there's just something that's a bit more awesome mm. um, and the wood is uh, but you're among the best work in the world and you know what is amazing with I think the DNAD awards is it doesn't matter what level that you get it's like it's like a time capsule of history of that year mm. and if you're recognised either on the short list a wood a graphite a yellow or even a black um, then you are going down in history as one of the best creators at this point in time. And, Buck, who doesn't want to be part of that? Totally. <laughs> Love it. You know, so, yeah, one of these puppies on your shelf. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. That was a tiny one of these I got as a student. Oh, cool. And that's what, uh, you get a wee, like a half version yeah. of it is the new blood pencil. Brilliant. And, uh, and that helps you grow up to the, to the big the full ones. Yeah. That's very cool. There we go. Thank you for joining <laughs> Thank us. Thank you for Joe. joining us. Pleasure. Mate. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been really good speaking to you. It's been fun. Okay. <laughs> Cheers.